Heavenly Father, we are grateful that you have given us this privilege and opportunity to come together, to lift your name high, to, to open your word, and to, to receive from this bread of life. And I pray that by your spirit, you would give us understanding, and uh, may Jesus be lifted high. In your name we pray. Amen. Ezra chapter 5 is where we are heading now. And we're looking at verses 1 and 2. Now the prophets Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Edu, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the, in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, and Jeshua, the son of Jozadak, arose and began to rebuild the house of God that is in Jerusalem. And the prophets of God were with them, supporting them. So we, we noticed from last week that this begins really uh, back in verse 24 of the previous verse or the previous chapter chapter 4 verse 24 the work of the house of God that is in Jerusalem stopped and it ceased until the second year of the reign of Darius king of Persia now keeping that in mind that this is Darius different than the Darius of Daniel all right important for us to realize this Daniel chapter 6 is Darius the Mede with Daniel in the lion's den. In this instance, this is Darius that is much later than that first Darius. All right. So we had seen last week that there are a lot of guys that ruled that had the same names. You just put a one or a two or a three after it to say this is the first or the second or the great or... Um, whatever we jumping in here we see right from the beginning of chapter 5 we touched on it somewhat last week but we're we're going to be spending more time looking at at this these first couple of verses and it's their uh, corresponding prophecies that is being given now, the prophets Haggai and Zechariah. So this brings us to the, the books by these prophets' names, Haggai and Zechariah. So let's go to Haggai chapter 1. Uh, easy way to find these is if you know where Matthew is, go backwards, two books, you're at Zechariah. Go back one book, you're at Haggai. One more book. One more book from there, yes. Thank you. So that'll get you to both of those. We're looking at Haggai to begin with. And I want us to see a bit of the the uh, rundown for time timeline that's going on here. So you remember in in Ezra chapter four twenty four, it's what year of Darius? First year. It's the second year. Second year. So the second year, the reign of Darius, king of Persia, is when the uh, temple resumed being built. So we're coming now into Haggai, and we're going to see a bit of Haggai's timeline, all right? So let's have a look here at verse 1 to begin with. We did it, but I want us, we're going we're gonna, to uh, drill down on some things here so that we'll remind ourselves of the timeline and so that we can track what's taking place. Okay, so verse 1, uh, please, Corey. Oh, I'm sorry. Is it time to read? Yes. I apologize. Haggai 1 1. 
In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, saying... And then goes on to speak about uh, what the word of the Lord was. Now, we dealt with that last week, but <clears throat> pegging this timeline, all right? This is showing us until the second year of Darius. And now we see this is the second year of Darius. The word comes by the prophet Haggai. And uh, it's going to occur over uh, a few months that this is going to be taking place, all right? Different... Uh, prophecies, different words of the Lord that Haggai is going to be bringing to the people of Jerusalem, the Jews. So his first message is brought here in the first 11 verses, telling them it's, it's necessary for them to uh, resume the building of the temple. Because up until this point, what's been taking place and what kind of a time frame has passed since they had stopped working on the temple? Pardon me? 16 years. So 16 years since they last worked on the temple. And so far, only the temple has been, or excuse me, only the foundation has been laid. What have they been doing in the meantime? Why did they stop? Enemies got a stop work order from the king. The enemies did not get a stop work order from the king. We, we think that the way it flows when you read Ezra chapter 4, remember that we had seen that, that Ezra is doing sort of a, um, a parenthesis here. So we're going to be going back and forth between Ezra, Haggai, and Zechariah here tonight, okay? So if you want to come back to Ezra for a moment, just have a look at this. And you can see that uh, in verse... Uh, five, four and five, that the people of the land, they discouraged the people of Judah, made them afraid to build. So they bribed counselors against them in order to frustrate their purpose. So the work that they had done all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia. So the remaining years that Cyrus reigned, although Cyrus was the one who gave the command for them to go back and expressly to do what? To, to build the temple. So, in verse 6, we start to see, and then in the reign of Ahasuerus, or Xerxes, in the beginning of his reign, they wrote an accusation against the inhabitants. And But the, we see, if we, we keep on reading, we're not going to revisit it tonight. Ex, uh, sorry, we're not going to re-read it tonight. But to keep in mind, when it says to put a stop to the building of the walls, the rebuilding of the city, all right. So this is, remember, Ezra's another 80 years before he's coming back or before, before he's on the scene. But Ezra is recounting this at this point to say this is not the first time that the Jews, that our people, have experienced this type of opposition. So in just reading it straight through, it seems like it's chronological, but it can't be because it's speaking about they wrote a letter to Ahasuerus. And Ahasuerus doesn't reign until after Darius. Do you remember the timeline that we had seen last week? So, with that being the case, uh, verses 6 through, through 23 is is one of these. It's so verse 6 to verse 23 it's in parentheses because it fits the theme of what's going on here but it's not the chronology of what's going on. So in here you've got uh, we're just going to make it easy uh, Xerxes which is Ahasuerus if you're looking if your translation has that but he doesn't come until after Darius uh, we have Cyrus, then Darius, then we've got Xerxes. So they stopped because of the frustration. That doesn't mean, oh, this is so frustrating. It means that they, they worked 
to, to, um, to frustrate the plans, to, to try to bring it to a stop, and they did. Do you need that back or forward? Which would be easier? Sure. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. So they ended up giving in to this, this, this opposition, and we see that uh, in verse 24 then it resumes, okay? So verse five is here, and it picks up in verse 24. So if you took out, if you ignored verses six to 23 while you're reading consecutively, you're gonna get the flow of the time frame. But he inserts it there because of the, the similarities of the parallels of things that took place then and what was going on when Ezra came back for the purpose of starting to rebuild the walls. And it was frustrated by a decree of, the, of Darius and, um, or excuse me, not Darius, but of, of Xerxes. And then Nehemiah is successful in getting a decree from Artaxerxes, who's here. To rebuild the walls. So we've got four books that are working together in a, in a similar time frame, which is Ezra, chapters 1 through 6, is dealing with the rebuilding of the temple. Then seven through the remaining part of the book is, is bringing in the time of Ezra coming back and then Nehemiah comes back, uh, comes to Jerusalem about 15 years later, I think it is. So we have those books that are, are working together in, in uh, the same time frame and bringing into it, there's one more minor prophet. We've got Haggai, Zechariah, and take a guess on the third one. Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Malachi. And not just because it appears there in, in that chronological order, ordering of our Bible, because um, well, we're not going to get into the chronological or, or the, the, uh, the layout of the different books. It's not always in chronological order. But Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi are dealing with events that are going on in the book of Ezra. But Ezra spans about a, uh, 80 years, 90 years. Okay, so it's not all in a matter of a few months. Can I give you one example, just so that we have the idea that not all books are in chronological order? We've got Ezra, the next book is Nehemiah. Nehemiah, and then the next book is Esther. They're not in chronological order. Esther should, in a sense, Go, it should be Ezra, Esther, Nehemiah. So is there a reason for that? The books are where they are. Uh, yes, there is, because Ezra and Nehemiah had formerly been one volume. Ezra slash Nehemiah. So it was one scroll, uh, if you will. And Esther was a standalone book that uh, was... Under, was recognized that it, it was inserted in a timeline about midway through Ezra's uh, scroll, Ezra's account, the book of Ezra alone. It's like Ruth comes after Judges, but it occurs during the period of judges. the Judges. So it's sort of, it, you get Judges and then book of Ruth. Here is, here's uh, some events that took place during this time frame of the period of the judges. That help a little bit to get a, an idea of, of some of the placements of the books. All right, so we are in, in Haggai then, recognizing the fact that, that the work had been frustrated. They had stopped the work, but, but God didn't tell them to stop. The king didn't tell them to stop. Why did they stop? Because they feared man more than they feared God. Because they got tired of the opposition that was coming against them. God expressly set 
sent them back for the purpose of rebuilding the temple. And they were excited to do so, weren't they? The, the sound that they brought up, the shout when the, the foundation had been laid was so loud that people all around heard them. Well, their enemies uh, rose up against them. They ceased work on the temple. And they went about their business because now they're in Jerusalem. Well, they're not about to go back to Persia because I mean, it just it doesn't make sense. We're home now. Um, we'll get surely sometime the temple will be built. But we'll, we'll see. You know, sort of that I, kind of an idea. But the Lord rebukes them because for 16 years the temple has been laying without any activity, but they've been going about their business as though there's no problem, as though there's no issue going on. And so the Lord says, it's not a time for you to be building and living in your paneled houses while the house of the Lord lies in ruins. And because you've, you've, you've gotten the wrong uh, sequence of events and the wrong um, pursuit that you go about your business and you eat, but you're hungry. You, you fill your, your purses, your bank accounts, but they're empty. You plant, uh, but there's, there's nothing to harvest. Everything is, so this is Haggai, all right? This is Haggai's rebuke to them. So this is uh, chapters, excuse me, verses 1 through 11. That's the first message that was brought to them. And then we're going to see here in verses 12, through 15, Haggai 1. Uh, it says that, that um, uh, where are we at here? Look at verse 15. It, it shows us they decided, yes, we're going to respond to the word of the Lord. And verse 15, on the 24th day of the month, in the sixth month in the second year, they began to work. Let's have a look at our screen for a moment, all right? We'll go to the second, the second one. There we go. This is on our calendar because uh, historians have calculated and they know what year, according to our calendar, that uh, the second year of Darius reigned. So we can see here that it was August 29th which corresponds to the, um, the sixth month on the first day of the month. Well, according to, uh, it fell on our calendar on August 29th of the year 520. And then in, in verse 15, when they began or they resumed work on the temple, they did so on the 21st of September. But it's the 24th day of, this, of that sixth month. It's just the way it, it corresponds, correlates to our calendar. Because our calendar doesn't sync up directly with a Jewish calendar. Understand? Yes. Well, they, they resume this work on the temple. Why is it that they begin to, to build if there's still opposition? Uh, we see that there's other dates that are indicated there. We'll come to them in just a, a couple of moments, all right? Why, why did they begin to start work again on the temple if there's still opposition? They were encouraged to. They were encouraged to, all right? The Lord encouraged them to do it. Pardon me? The Lord encouraged them to do it. All right, the Lord encouraged them to do it. So there's an, an aspect of that is correct. But there's, there's stronger language to it than just that he encouraged them. So he did encourage, but he, commanded. moreover, he, or more so, I should say, he commanded that they build the temple. It's not like, hey, you know what? I th now, I'm not minimizing you saying that encouragement. But sometimes we think of encouragement of, hey, come on, you can do it. Yeah, yeah you'll get there and... Uh, encouragement is not just nice words. This is more than, than being an encouragement. What, is, what does it mean to encourage? 
to promote. To promote. All right, anything else? What else comes to mind? To lift up. What does it mean if you're discouraged? Don't do it. If you're down, you don't do it. What is, the, what is the word that is in common in both of those? Encourage and discourage. Courage. Courage. So, if you are discouraged, what are you lacking? Courage. If you're being encouraged, what is being grant what what is being poured into you in a sense what is what is being boosted you're empowered your courage is being boosted right it's but this is not a pep talk for encouragement this is your courage is found in me is the lord says not in your enemies around you so they gave ear to the word of the Lord. It wasn't just some guy comes on the scene, um, hey guy, comes on the scene and says, hey listen guys, you know, this isn't right. We need to do something, but that's not what this is. The word of the Lord came to them in the mouth of Haggai, saying, thus says the Lord, not, well, I kind of feel, and I have a sense, no, this is, this is what the Lord says. And look at verse 13. Chapter 1 and verse 13. Uh, John, would you read that for us? Nice and loud. 13? Yes. Then spake Haggai, the Lord's messenger, and the Lord's message unto the people, saying, I am with you, saith the Lord. So look at this. He says what? I am with you. With you. It's a reminder that this is not a job that you're going to do on your own. I am with you. And so, the spirit of Zerubbabel and um, Joshua, the high priest, so the governor and the high priest, and all the remnant of the people is now stirred. They're, they're, it's similar to what takes place back in Ezra. Remember it says that the Lord stirred the spirit of, of Cyrus, and then to send them the, the remnant back to give permission, the decree for them to go back. And he stirred the spirit of, of the people to go about the work that the Lord had commissioned them to do. Now, that brings us to chapter 2 of Haggai. The time frame is back again. In the seventh month on the twenty first day of the month. So this is uh, a month later. Remember, in the sixth month on the 24th day, they have resumed the work. And now, we are a month later, the seventh month on the 21st day, almost a month later. And he says, encourage Zerubbabel and Joshua and all the people. And here's what he says. Look at verses 3, and we're going to go to, let's go to 6. Uh, let's go to 7. And we're at Carolyn. Who of you is left? 2, Who's verse so 3 to 7. Sorry, Carolyn. Okay. Who of you is left? Who saw this house? in its former glory. How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? But now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord, be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest, be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord, and work, for I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt and my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. Now, I, that's only seven. That's, we need one more verse. 
I will shake all nations and the desires of all nations will come and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. All right, now there's a name here of the Lord that is repeated several times. What does that mean? All right, so we've got Lord, which is capital, all caps, yes. L-O-R-D. All right, Lord, and it's two ways. One, <coughs> literally, is, is more hosts, Lord of hosts. And some translations translate that Lord Almighty. Have a look at... That's something going on here. Uh, if we look at this slide, this is the name Lord of Hosts and or Lord Almighty, okay? And this is the percentage of verses in in each of these books. So you see that, that it, it takes in um, Second Samuel, all, all these books that have the name Lord of Hosts in it. Um, there's a couple of books that are missing just because th this graph is just being used to show uh, some comparative levels. And take a note that Haggai is two chapters. Zechariah is 14 chapters, and Malachi is 4 chapters. But we've got Isaiah, which is 66 chapters, and only 4 almost 5, not quite 5% of Isaiah's verses have the name Lord of Hosts. Malachi, Haggai, and Zechariah they are up there, the, the most usage of this name, Lord of Hosts. So that 40, almost 44% of the verses in Malachi have the name, Lord of Hosts. Almost 32% of the verses in Haggai have the name, Lord of Hosts. And Zechariah has almost 22% of the name Lord of Hosts. Why is the name Lord of Hosts used so frequently in these three books? Jesus. All right, Jesus. All right, Jesus. That's, that's always the answer. If you, don't know any, if you don't know what the answer they're looking for, just say Jesus. <laughs> the Lord of Hosts speaks of the army of the Lord. And All he's right. the captain of the army of the Lord. And so he's coming to protect them in the rebuilding because it was the fear and the discouragement of the enemies that kept them from building. Yes, exactly. So Lord of hosts, when we see Lord of hosts, we see it in Joshua chapter 5. The commander of the Lord's army. And it's Jesus, the pre-incarnate Jesus, that is coming there to Joshua as Joshua is contemplating what is next. How do we enter into this land that God had promised to us? And without strategizing, because it's not up to man to strategize. It's not up to our strategies. So he's waiting on the Lord. What do, I, what do we do here? But he doesn't know who this personage is that is approaching him with his sword drawn. But this is Jesus, and he gives the battle plan, because I guarantee you that there's no way Joshua would have come up with marching around Jericho once a day for six days and seven times on the seventh day and not saying a word. And then on the seventh day after the seventh time, blow the trumpets and shout to the Lord, for the Lord has given the city. God was giving them the strategy. And what does the Lord tell Joshua over and over again, particularly in the first chapter of Joshua, as he's telling him, this is what I'm going to get you to do. Moses is now dead. You're the new leader, but you're not on your own. What is the thing that he tells him over again? 
Be of good courage. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Be of good courage. I am with you. And it's here, in one of the places, that the Lord says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So that's Joshua chapter 1. And now, this is a people. How many people are there here? How many Jews have come back? Do you remember? Yeah, 46 and some odd thousand, right? And if you count all their servants, you're sitting somewhere around 50,000, 52,000 people. That's not a really huge contingent of people. And they're not militia. They're, there's, there's no standing army. And the Lord says to them, did you notice? Look here in, uh, in verse 5. Uh, ver the last word, the last, last phrase of, of verse 4. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts, the Lord Almighty. According to the covenant I made with you when you came out of Egypt. He's saying, I am with you. That was according to that covenant. He told them, I am with you. So he says, my spirit, what? What does he remind them? What does he encourage them with? My faith. It, from, from, the, from the text here, what does he say? My what? My spirit, what is it? My spirit remains or abides among you. And then he says, yes, say it. Fear you not. He says, I am doing a work here. Remember what he says just a few verses earlier? How many? How many of you saw the, this house before it was destroyed? Bef before you were taken into captivity? He says, and, and how do you see it now? Well, he already knows how they see it because we're told how they see it back in Ezra and his account. Uh, how did I wind up in Ezekiel? My, my pages <laughs> flipped on me. <laughs> All right. In, in Ezra chapter 3, when it says that many of the priests and Levites of the father's houses, old men who had seen the first house, what did they do? They wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of this house being laid. So the Lord knows what they, they experience. He knows their hearts. He knows what they have just uh, shown, expressed. But this is some almost two decades earlier. And the Lord's reminding them, listen, you might, in your own way of thinking, have this idea that this is, this is an, an insignificant thing. It's, it's nothing like it used to be. See, when, when things don't appear in as grand as we expect them to be, or when we, when we measure them against what we've experienced in the past, and if it's not the same, if it's not as, it doesn't give us the same feelings or whatever, we can tend to be trusting our feelings and our emotions to motivate us for the task at hand or the thing that the Lord is calling us to. And if our emotions don't measure up to the task based on our experiences of the past, we can end up losing our zeal for what the Lord has called us to do. Because we're measuring it according to our metrics instead of the Word of God. If God is telling us to do something, why is He telling us to do it? If, that's his plan. That's his plan. Because he, he doesn't just do stuff just to say, here's a task, um, give it a go. He doesn't do things as acts of futility. He always has intention and purpose in the things he leads us. And it's always, always, always for his glory, right? It's not just to blow off steam or to waste time. It's never that. God doesn't waste time. And so 
He has commanded them to go back and build this temple. But their zeal has waned. They've had this opposition. But the Lord says, do you, do you not have it in your eyes that this is just a, a small thing? And when he says a small thing, what's another way of saying that? You look at it as being insignificant. But he says what? Verse 4. Look at it again. You look at it as being significant, but he tells him, Zerubbabel and Joshua, he tells them what? Be strong. Be strong. He says it twice. Yet now, be strong, O Zerubbabel and Joshua. And he says it again. Be strong, all you people. Not just the ones, not the twos, but everybody. Be strong, and the, the, your strength is going to be where? In the Lord. Keep that in mind. Be strong. So we're going to put it right here in the middle. But we got to realize what that strength is. Because as he, as he finishes saying that, he says, Work for I am with you, says the Lord. We've already dealt with this, but we're coming back and, and layering it on top of each other. Because we're putting the, the pieces together to see that the Lord is dealing with their hearts and their discouragement. He knows that we are but flesh. And so he reminds us over and over again, gives us his word, repeats it, corrects us, rebukes us, encourages us, teaches us by his word. And he says, listen, that this house, you might look at it as being insignificant or small today, but I'm telling you that this is no insignificant work that you're doing here today. Because to this temple, temple, my glory is going to come in a way that none of you or your forefathers ever saw or even have the capacity to dream of what it's going to be like. Because it will be to this temple that they're in the process of, of working on to rebuild now that what's going to happen. Jesus. What is it? Jesus is going to show up. Jesus is going to show up because this is what year? B.C. How? 520. 520 B.C. So in 550 years... God's going to come to his temple. Jesus is going to come to the temple. And that's no small deal. He says, The glory, in verse 9, of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I'm going to give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. So the Lord himself is going to come to this temple. But there's more going on here than just that. So we had seen that uh, chapter 2 and verse 1, that, that there's this, this further date. Now, what I want us to do is go to, to Zechariah. So you probably just have to look on the next page. All right? So let's, let's look back at our screen again. And as we look here at Zechariah 1.1, 1, 1, Debbie, can you uh, take that for us? In the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Ida, the prophet, saying. And then goes on and begins to give, <coughs> give uh, the word of the Lord. But we're not looking at that word just now. But I want us to see what when does this happen? Verse 1, it happens in? The eighth month of the second year. The second year. So do you see the sequence? Haggai 1.1, 1, 1, it's the sixth month. At the end of chapter 1 and verse 15, it's still the sixth month, but it's the latter part, the 24th day of the sixth month. Now in chapter 2 of Haggai, it's the seventh month. In Zechariah 1, it's the eighth month. Chapter 2, verse 10, is the ninth month. So Zechariah 1 comes before chapter 2, 10. Yes, it does. All right. So Zechariah 1 
through uh, 1 1 through to, to verse 7, all right? Zechariah 1, verses 1 to 7. If you were to take it in chronological order, those seven verses come after Haggai 2 in verse 9. In, in chronological order. You follow that? Make sense? So if you have a look at our screen, you see that um, it's using our dates, all right? So on, in August, Haggai's first message in, in Haggai 1, 1 to 11. In September, Haggai, the last three verses of Haggai, the temple is resuming. Then Haggai has a second message, October 17th. And then Zechariah, verses 1 through, uh, through did I say 7? 1 through 7? 1 through 6 is, um, is Zechariah's ministry has begun. And so he's giving his first utterance. This is what the Lord says. And then Haggai is going to have yet another word on the 24th day of the ninth month. So the next month after that. And then he'll have a couple of more messages following that point. Haggai will be. And then Zechariah is going to resume. Okay, so let's, let's just consider for a moment what, what the Lord says through Zechariah. In verse 2, the Lord was very angry with your fathers. So say to them, thus declares the Lord of hosts, return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Don't be like your fathers, to whom the former prophet cried out, thus says the Lord of hosts. You notice how many times? Lord Almighty, Lord of hosts. He says, return from your evil ways and from your evil deeds, but they did not hear or pay attention to me, declares the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? But my words and my statutes, which I commanded, my, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, did they not overtake your fathers? So they repented and said, as the Lord of hosts, there's that name again, purposed to deal with us for our ways and deeds, so has he dwelt with, so has he dealt with us. So then Haggai is going to continue. Now keep in mind, these are these men, prophets, they're just mouthpieces for the Lord. It's not their opinions. It's not their assessment of the situation and saying, well, I, I kind of feel like the Lord might be saying this. You hear that a lot today, where people say, you know, I, 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 I feel I may have a word from the Lord. Prophecy is not about just trying things out. Not trying to act, activate things to, to, or to practice and, and make it happen. I'm stopping there because that's a really quick and easy detour. And I'm not going to get, that's another box I need to make sure I don't get on tonight. But, but do you need to see that this is the word of the Lord. The Lord is speaking to his people. And he's doing it through Haggai. And now Zechariah comes into the picture. And now Haggai is going to pick it up once again in verse um, 10 of chapter 2. So the word of the Lord comes to him yet again. And then verse 11. Let's read verse 11. kind of need to take it as, it as it appears here. So let's take it verse 11 down to 19. This is what the Lord Almighty says. As the priests, ask the priests what the law says. If someone carries a consecrated meat in the fold of their garment, and that fold touches some bread or stew, some wine, olive oil, or other food, does it become consecrated? The priests answered no. And Haggai said, if a person defiled by it, contact with a dead body touches one of these, 
thinks, does it become defiled? Yes, the priest replied, it becomes defiled. Then Haggai said, so it is with this people and this nation, my sight, declares the Lord. Whatever they do and whatever they offer there is defiled. Now give careful thought to this from this day on. Consider how things were before one stone was laid on another in the Lord's temple. When anyone came to a heap of twenty measures, there were only ten. When anyone went to the wine vat to draw fifty measures, there was only twenty. I struck all the work of your hands with blight, mildew, and hail. Yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. From this day on, from this twenty-fourth day of the ninth month, give careful thought to the day when the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid. Give careful thought, is there any, is yet any seed left in the barn? Until now, the wine and the fig tree, the pomegranate and the olive tree have not borne fruit. From this day on, I will bless you. All right, here's, here's what we need. Do you understand what's going on here? Are you following the flow of, of what the word of the Lord is? Let me help you with this. Why, why does he talk about if the priest carries um, some of the holy meat, meaning meat that had been uh, of an animal that had been sacrificed, and now that meat is being taken for the purpose of feeding the priests. He carries it in the fold of his garment. If that garment touches something else, does, does that something else all of a sudden become holy? No. He says, but, uh, and then, and of course they answered in verse 12, well, no. So Haggai said, well, if somebody is unclean, if they contact a dead body, but they touch something, does it become unclean? Yes, it does. And we can look at um, Numbers chapter 19 deals with that. Why does the Lord speak about a garment that carries something um, consecrated, doesn't make something else holy if it touches it, but if, if somebody, if a garment touches a dead body and becomes defiled and unclean and touches another person, they become unclean. Why does he say this? What, what is the point of that? He, he says, so it is with this people and with the nation before me. But how is it like that? How, is, how are this people like that illustration? Take on the uncleanness of the people that are God. Okay. <laughs> any, any other ideas? Any other thoughts? Let me help you out. What has the Lord been addressing? What is what did Haggai begin addressing? What what's the Lord through Haggai speaking to them about? What were they derelict in? What were they not paying attention to? Temple. The temple. All right. So, he's saying this. While the temple remained in ruins, you just went on your bus about your business as though it's no big deal. It doesn't affect or influence or mean anything. Yet, you, you found that everything you touched was like it became unclean. It's like it became defiled. It's not that they're not building, because they are building now. But the Lord is reminding them, don't get caught up in this again, because you've already seen what has taken place. When you ignored my house, you went about your own business as though everything was good. He says that's just as absurd, even more absurd, than, than somebody who touches a dead body and goes and touches everybody else and thinking it's no big deal. Like, nobody will care. It doesn't matter. But the Lord's saying, no, I, I have commanded that if, if you touch a dead body and touch another person, you have caused them to be unclean. So don't just be haphazard in your dealings with corpses. And don't be haphazard in your dealing with people after you've come in contact with a corpse. You have treated my house like a corpse for these past 16 years and just went about like it's no big deal. And you defiled yourself and everyone else around you. 
So he's saying it's time for you to, to, to recognize this and to acknowledge your sin and to repent. He's saying it, it's something like this. If a spouse start, is doing all kinds of nice stuff for their spouse, if an individual is doing something nice for their spouse, buying nice stuff, doing nice things, being courteous and so on, and it goes on and on. And then uh, all the while they're carrying on an illicit relationship with another person. Are those niceties, are those good things of any use or benefit? No. He's saying that's what this is like. So don't, he says, he says, listen, when before one stone was placed upon a stone in the temple, how did you fare? So notice the, the connection. You laid the foundation, and before mm -hmm. one stone was laid on another, and you, you, the, the work stopped, you did the foundation, you got discouraged, you left, because your eyes were on yourself and not on me. Because I'm your strength. And you became afraid and you stopped your work. <clears throat> so how did, you, how did you manage then? How, how did you make out? How, how did that work for you? He says, when you came, th this is what this means. With one heap, you came to a heap of 20 measures. You, you found there was only 10. Came to a wine vat to draw 50 measures. There was only 20. What does that mean? It means you expected there to be this this abundance, but when you came to it, you found that there was less than should have been there. But it was because of your ignorance, of your negligence, better said, negligence toward me. I struck you, he said. So in verse 18, from this day onward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, because what happened just prior to this, Zechariah brings a word and says, don't go back where your fathers were. The prophets brought words of rebuke and correction, but your fathers didn't pay attention. How did they fare? Where are they today? So he says, up to this point, there was, there was no seed in the barn. The, the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree, they've yielded nothing. But look what he says, the end of verse 15, uh, verse 19, sorry. But from this day on, I will bless you. You turn your heart towards me, what do I do? What does the Lord do? He says, it's a blessing. There's blessing in obedience. There's blessing in putting the Lord first. So the Lord comes, the word of the Lord comes yet again on the 24th day. So the same day, tell Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, I'm about to shake the heavens and the earth and to overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I'm about to destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the nations and overthrow the chariots and their riders and the horses and their, the riders, uh, their riders shall go down. Everyone by the sword of his brother on that day declares the Lord. I'll take you, O Zerubbabel, my servant. The son of Shealtiel declares the Lord and make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you. Declares whom? The Lord Almighty, the Lord of hosts. Interchangeable word there. So he's encouraging the people, he's encouraging Zerubbabel that this work, carry it out, carry it out in my strength, in the encouragement that I have given you now. And, and we see that in, in Zechariah chapter 1 and verse 7, this is now the 24th day of the 11th month. So this is two months later. Two months later. Got it? Now, from this point on, until, uh, boy, chapter 6 or chapter 7, I think it is. Uh, chapter 7. So chap from chapter 1 and verse 7 right through until chapter 7 is what the Lord is giving Zechariah in this 11th month, two months later. And what was the last word that the Lord gave to Haggai? Tell Zerubbabel. Speak to Zerubbabel. 
I'm going to do some things. And I'm, these, the kingdoms around you, they, they can't stand. It's my word alone that stands. And, and this passage is quoted. It's going to shake everything that can be shaken in Hebrews chapter 12. So that, there's, that only those things that are of God, only those things that cannot be shaken will remain. So the things of the Lord and of His Christ, they shall reign, they shall stand. Now, we're not going to get into all of this first part of what the Lord is speaking because it's dealing with end time stuff. It's dealing with, with other stuff coming up. But I want us to see chapter 3, okay? Chapter 3, Zechariah. And keeping in mind that chapter 3, what of Zechariah, it's dealing with getting ready for, this, for what comes next. Because if you're building the temple, what's going to take place once the temple is, is built? The resuming of the sacrifice. The resume, uh, not quite. Because remember in chapter, in Ezra chapter 2, what did they do? They rebuilt the altar. altar. Was it 2 or 3? Um, uh, chapter 3, the first part of chapter 3, they rebuilt the altar. So the altar is rebuilt and they've already been, they've been sacrificing. And it was on the same place, uh, the, the same foundation where, or location where the altar had stood previously in front of the temple. So sacrifices have been going on to some degree or another. But now that the temple is, is underway and when the time comes for it to be completed, what's the next thing? Consecration of the temple and, and for the priests then to resume their, in, the, their complete duties within the, the worship of God in, in that context. If this, or since the temple had been laying in ruins for 16 years after they set up the, the foundation. Who do you suppose, everybody's responsible because they all pulled back, right? Because everybody's responsible for their own actions or, or lack thereof. But who do you suppose is, would be considered most responsible for the dealings with the temple being built or not built? The high priest. So the governor, in a sense, and the high priest. So the high priest, he's, he's the one whose duty it is to look after the affairs of the temple. So, so if, if he's the one who's most responsible, who do you suppose is going to be considered the most guilty? The people. Because the high priest. They be the, the high priest. Well, if the high priest is the most responsible, the people stand up. he didn't though. That's the whole idea. No, this, this, is, this is about he didn't stand up. He stood, stepped back and he, he didn't lead the people. So he would be the one that probably most people would hold. Look, look what you did. So Zechariah chapter 3 deals with this. Where the Lord or the angel of the Lord shows Joshua the high priest so it shows whom? The prophet, Zechariah. Uh, we're at, at Deb, are we? Oh, Todd. oh, Todd, we haven't gotten. Okay. So we're in Zechariah chapter 3. Look at, let's take it 1 through, through 5. And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was standing before the angel, clothed with filthy garments. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, Remove the filthy garments from him. And to <coughs> him he said, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. And I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord was standing by. 
So here is Joshua the high priest in a vision to Zechariah standing and his, his high priestly garments are what? They're, they're more than filthy. The, the word here is used of filled with the worst filth you can imagine of the day. Okay, so we'll say it that way and leave it at that. It's not just, well, I got a bit of dirt on me. All right? He is a complete mess. And if any garments that somebody has that you don't want to get filled with dirt, and, and we're talking about bodily filth, would be like this, these garments at all costs, you want to guard against this. When the high priest went about his duties in the temple, they, they were, um, they took great measures to make sure that they stood before the Lord blameless and, and they were meticulous with what they did to make sure that their, their garments were cared for and, and uh, mended if they accidentally get, uh, get some kind of a, a tear or a pick or whatever. And when they wear out, they, they did not just throw them away. They used them for other sacred uh, uses or they buried them. So for instance, they would use them to make the wicks. They would, they would tear them into strips to make the wicks for the uh, lampstand in the most holy place or in the holy place. So things like that. So here he is now in a vision that he's standing and he's, he's filled with bodily filth all over his garments. And, and who's there to accuse? So and by the very name, Satan, the accuser. He's there to accuse. He's disqualified. He's useless. He's unworthy. But the Lord rebuked him. And to accuse him, but it doesn't say that he said any of those things. No, no. When I, what I just said was putting in the mouth, like putting through what what kind of things could have been to accuse. The Lord. But before he has a chance, has a chance to speak. The thank Lord. you for for uh, clarifying that. My mind fills in the gaps and the pictures, and it doesn't always inform as, as I already got the picture formulated in my mind. My wife is great to help me through. They didn't get that. That is already in my head. So he's there to accuse, but the Lord does not permit him to accuse. Silences the accuser. And then... Look at verse 4. I will clothe, I have taken your iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments, garments, clothing. And then we see in, in verse 8 Hear now, O Joshua the high priest, you and your friends who sit before you, for they are men who are a sign. Behold, I will bring my servant. The branch. Oh, that's interesting. Where have we heard that before? Isaiah. 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 Where else? So Isaiah where? 11, verse 1. Where else do we hear it? Jeremiah said it. No longer will they say, um, thus saith the Lord who brought us up out of Egypt, but they will say, thus saith the Lord <clears throat> who brought us up out of the north. The branch, that's Jeremiah chapter 23, speaks of the branch who's going to come and bring deliverance. And then we see, uh, we see it again in Jeremiah chapter 33, the branch. And then we'll see it again in um, chapter 6 of Zechariah and verse 12. Have a look. Uh, let's look at verse, uh, verse 8. No, sorry, 9. The word of the Lord came to me. Take from the exiles, and then he names um, a number, uh, three of them, that who have arrived from Babylon, and go the same day to the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah. 
Take from them silver and gold and make a crown. Set it on the head of whom? Joshua the high priest. And say to him, thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, for he shall branch out from his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall build the temple of the Lord and shall bear royal honor and shall sit and rule on his throne and there shall be a priest on his throne and the council of peace shall be between them both. Now this is strange language because there were no thrones in the temple. There were no seats in the temple. Hebrew says it very clearly that the priest's work was never done. But the, our high priest, Jesus, of the order of Melchizedek, after he had offered sacrifice once and for all, what did he do? He sat down. sat down at the right hand. So where is the throne in the temple? There is a throne, but no, no, no Aaronic priest, meaning a descendant of Aaron, could sit on it. Where's the, where is the, that throne? It's the ark, but it's not there anymore. It's the Ark of the Covenant is the throne of God. But it's, it was not in this temple. But where the Lord sits, He does not sit in a temple that is made with hands because that's a copy of that which is in heaven. So Joshua stood as a symbol, a foreshadowing of the branch who would come. And who is the branch? Jesus. Jesus. Let's look at one last thing. First, were you reading a minute ago about the throne? Uh, that's chapter 6 and, and verse, um, the, the verse 12 and 13. Okay. Now, uh, chapter 4. We're going to wrap things up in chapter 4. Zechariah? Still Zechariah, yes. So the angel who had been talking to him and showed him the vision of, of Joshua the high priest shows him again and says, he says, what do you see? Verse 2. Now, let's take it from there. Uh, Corey, will you take us down to verse, let's go to verse 7. Pardon me? I said I don't get to read. Oh, you didn't. Oh, I'm still bright. <laughs> you get to read. Yes, you do. No, not me. No, not you. Not yet. <laughs> I've got two verses for you. <laughs> or one, uh, two verses. So Deb, take us to seven. Chapter two. Chapter four, verse two through seven. And he said to me, what do you see? I said, I see and behold a lamp stand all of gold with a bowl on the top of it. And seven lamps on it with seven lips on each lamp that are on the top of it. And there are two olives by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on the left. And I said to the angel who talked with me, What are these, my lord? Then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? I said, No, my lord. Then he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel you shall become a plain. And he shall bring forward the top stone amidst shouts of grace, grace to it. Hmm. So he's showing him that um, the, the, this is a picture of the glory of the Lord that is there. And that it's, you're going to accomplish this. Remember Haggai's been speaking to him, Zerubbabel, I'm about to shake the heavens and so on. And he's going to bring to pass the, the building of the temple. And, and he tells him, but it's not by your strength. It's not by your might. He reminds him again. We isolate that. We know that verse fairly well. If you ask people that have been in church for a while, you, if you started saying, it's not by, and you start with that, uh, no doubt 80% of, of Christians that have been in the church for, for uh, some time would be able to finish it and say, it's not by might not by power but by my spirit says the lord of hosts but says the lord of hosts the lord almighty there he is again and but it's not many could not look at that and say well what is the context in which that's found 
Well, here is that context. And he's saying, this temple, God never asks us to do something that we're able to do in our own strength. He never asks us to do anything we can do in our own strength. He always asks us to do that which is required, that, we re that is necessary, that we depend on His strength. Always. Even for what we might estimate to be the most insignificant or mundane things. Because that's what they've considered this temple to be. Do you see this temple? Do, do you see it? How do you see it? Is it not as nothing in your own eyes? Is it not like something insignificant? So they might say, well, we can take this. I mean, what's, what's, what's here anyway? I mean, not much to it. The Lord is saying it's a matter of motive. It's a matter of, of correct attitude. It's a matter of worship. Everything you're doing here is, is unto me. It's not just I'm getting a job done. It's for my glory. So he says, all right, it looks like there's a mountain in the way, right? Because this, it's been 16 years dormant. We started up again, and you can be sure that opposition has resumed, right? And so the mountain begins to, to loom large once again, and the, the, the mind, the flesh would say, we can't do this. Look, this is what we saw before. But look what he says. Who are you, O great mountain? Zerubbabel is going to do this, but not in his own strength. And in, before Zerubbabel, or in front of Zerubbabel, this mountain, this obstacle is going to be turned into level ground. To what? Amid what? Shouts of? God bless it, but let's... Get, yeah. so, so the word there is literally grace. 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 Grace, grace to it, to amid, uh, to the sound of grace to it. And I just need to see um, one thing here. So it's the word hen, the word that, that is, is um, the word translated as grace. Now, God bless it. God's blessing or God's favor is what grace is, results in, right? But it's literally the word to, the, to shouts of grace. God's grace. God's grace is going to carry this to completion. Jesus said to Paul, My what is? My grace. My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Now, could he have just as easily said, um, my God blessed is sufficient for you? Could have, because what God blesses, that's, that's his favor, right? That's what grace is. But when we see shouts of God bless it, God bless it, we don't quite see it in the same way. It loses in English for us. The, the, the intensity, yeah. The intensity. God bless you when you sneeze. Like it just... But... But God's blessing is grace, right? God's blessing is what grace is. But we... Sometimes we minimize grace, the idea of grace as well. But let's see it as, as grace. It's, it's shouts, of grace. shouts of grace. And it's not, grace, you're going to come down. It's, it's not to the mountain. It's grace. Because of what the Lord is doing. Corey, will you take us... Um, and bring us not, 8 through 10 and this is where we're going to finish <clears throat> and I'm going to stop you part way through 10 okay because it starts a new thought moreover the word of the Lord came unto me saying the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house his hand shall also finish it and you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you for who has despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. Well, we'll stop. Okay, so we'll stop there just at the hand of Zerubbabel. We'll stop that because it starts a new thought after that. What's a plummet? Downward turn. Um, plummet. That's, that's what the thought is with that, but that's not what a pl this plummet is. No. <laughs> That, that's, that's why I asked the question, because plummet as it is, it doesn't, 
we don't talk that we don't use that. That's archaic English. Okay. The plum, is it like a plumb line where they have So what's a plumb line? Yes, it is a plumb like line. A thing that is like the string has like a I don't know, a thing on the bottom and it kind of helps measure, make sure everything's oh, level and stuff. Okay, so almost. Uh, so you are in the right you're in the right neighborhood. Uh, it's a weight on the end of a line or a string okay. so that that it will, once it's, gravity will cause that weight, once it stops swaying, that becomes your vertical straight line. <clears throat> a level is what would have uh, a fluid and, and then the bubble is in the middle, that's horizontal, or that's level horizontally. A plumb line it's, measures, um, you want it plumb, straight up and down, vertical, and you want it level. So this is what he's saying. As you're going about that, that this plumb line is going to be in your hand, they're going to rejoice to see this. And he makes the promise. Who's making the promise? God. Thus saith the Lord. the Lord of hosts. Over and over again. Because they're, they're few in number. They're not mighty. Not in their own strength. But the Lord is reminding them and giving them what? Courage. Courage. He says that whoever has despised the day of small things, remember what he said a couple of months earlier through Haggai? He said, how do you see it now? Is it as nothing in your own eyes? Isn't it just a small thing in your own eyes? He says, yet now be strong. O Zerubbabel, be strong, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, says the Lord. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. According to the covenant I made with you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit remains in your midst. My promise, my word, my covenant does not change. It has not changed. I'm still here, and I'm still here for my glory. In spite of your sin, your shortcomings, your failures, your weaknesses, I am still here. My purpose still stands. My promise is sure and steadfast. And will be, I will accomplish all that I've set out to do. So he says, and I'm telling you right now, Zerubbabel, he has laid the foundation of this house and his hands shall also complete it. And then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. So the promise is, it's going to be completed. And the opposition is not over. We're going to see that it, all of a sudden, it ramps right back up again. But that will be for next time that we're together. Amen.